Welcome to the Polar Bears International Tundra Connections program. It's polar bear season in Churchill, and we are coming to you live from the tundra buggy number one on the shores of the Hudson Bay with Arctic winds and polar bears just outside these windows. My name is Terry Goddard, and I'm the director of programming for the Center for Global Education, and it is my pleasure to help moderate this conversation that's going to be taking place here today. And today, we are learning about Arctic marine mammals, conservation, and education. Our target audience is classrooms and people like yourselves from all across the country. Our partners on today's program are Explore.org and the members of the Association of Zoo and Aquariums that are Arctic Ambassador Centers. This program will last about 50 minutes, including time and questions and answers, and hopefully we will squeeze in a shot or two of some of these polar bears that are right outside the window today. Now. A very important part about what we're going to be talking today is that it's not just about the mammals themselves, but it's also about the action that you as individuals, as classrooms, and as homes can make. And we'll be talking about how polar bears and our planet need you to take those actions in terms of conservation that's going to help our planet and help our polar bears. Now, this isn't just television. This isn't just a webcast. This is meant to be an interactive experience, a conversation between yourselves, our panel of scientists, and that goes both ways. So there's a few ways to do that. Method number one, right beside your window there where you see us streaming right at you is a chat window. We'd love all of you to say a quick little hello in there right now, and then we'll be able to feed that off to our guests. The second option is to send us emails to questions at pbears.org. And then the last option is through Twitter using hashtag Tundra Connections. And we will share those and pull from those throughout the entire webcast. And talking about the scientists who we have a privilege to meet, I'm going to pass this over to our scientists. Now we'll start at the opposite end of the table from myself and we'll get Stefan to introduce. Go ahead, Dr. Stefan Peterson. Great, thank you and welcome everyone. My name's uh, Stefan Peterson. I'm head of conservation and research at Assiniboine Park Zoo in Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba. So my uh, department is a fairly new one, an exciting development at uh, the Assiniboine Park Zoo. We have a, a new international polar bear conservation center that's been built in the last few years that's really looking uh, at what we can do here in Manitoba for polar bears. Um, but then within the zoo, many of you might be tuning in from zoos and you know that the, the, the collections are diverse and the conservation issues are diverse. Um, so we have similar sorts of projects and, uh, and uh, conservation that we're doing at the zoo to really look at all Arctic marine mammals. So that's kind of my expertise and uh, why I'm here today. Stefan, it's great to have you here. Thank you for Thank you. joining us. And sitting beside Stefan, we have Alyssa McCall. Alyssa? Hi, Alisa? everyone. <laughs> My name is Alyssa McCall. I'm the Field Programs Manager at Polar Bears International. I started working for PBI this year. I did my polar bear research on the Western Hudson Bay polar bears, so the ones that are right outside our window right now. And my research looked at their distribution and habitat selection based on our GPS color data. And I worked with Dr. Andy DeRoche out of the University of Alberta for that research. And uh, this is my fifth bear season here, and I'm so excited to be talking to everybody about conservation and education uh, focused on polar bears because that's really one of PBI's main goals. So thanks for joining. Thanks, Terry. God, well, it's so good to have you here, Elisa. And last but most definitely not least, we have Dr. Jennifer Kay. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Kay. I'm a professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I'm here with PBI this week uh, to share with you what's going on with the Arctic climate and the climate system as a whole. So uh, my research primarily focuses on sea ice and clouds and climate. And some of the tools that I use to do that are looking at satellite data, so knowing where the ice is and where it isn't. And then also I use global climate models and those are really useful both for helping us understand what we've observed and what's happening now and also what we can expect into the future because the only way to know about the future is to use a model. We can't observe the future or at least not yet I don't think. <laughs> so thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Jen, and thank you all panelists for being here and sharing some of your expertise with us today. Now, before we get too far into this, let's learn a little bit more about where we actually are on the planet. So I will ask Jen to give us the lowdown on where we happen to be today. 
Yeah, so all of us came in. We uh, flew up from Winnipeg, other places, on an airplane, and we landed uh, in Churchill. And then we got on a tundra buggy. Um, and from Churchill, about 15 miles away, uh, we were on this tundra buggy, uh, and we arrived where we are now on the shore of Hudson Bay. And I see BJ is bringing up the map showing Churchill, and so that's where we flew into, and then we got on the tundra buggy. Some of you might be wondering what a tundra buggy is. So just think school bus and monster truck wheels, and you kind of got the picture. Ours is outfitted as a mobile broadcast studio so that we can share uh, with zoos, with classrooms, uh, with the general audience, anyone who's interested in learning about polar bears and what's going on up here. So, yeah. No, oh, thank you so very much. Well, now we know where we are, so let's get into some of the topics that we are going to be looking at today. And today we are specifically looking at marine mammals. So I'm going to throw it back over to Stefan to tell us a little bit about what sort of animals fall into the category. Yeah, so um, when we think about marine mammals, lots of people think about dolphins and whales. So these are uh, mammals like primates, like bears, like all of the fur-covered, nursing their young sort of uh, mammals. But marine mammals are usually highly adapted for that environment. So they're seals and whales, uh, usually pretty hairless, except for the seals and the bears. Uh, but still, they need to get up to the surface to breathe, unlike fishes. And particularly, we're really interested in uh, Arctic marine mammals today. So. Not only have they got all the marine mammal kind of characteristics, they also have to deal with this added complication, which is everything freezes over. So that makes getting up to breathe in the winter more of a challenge. Uh, Alyssa and I were actually trying to figure out what other marine mammals, bear, polar bears are really kind of interesting where they're at home on the terrestrial environment on the land, but they're also perfectly at home in the water and on the ice. And the closest thing I think we came up with was sea otters, but I don't think sea otters spend a lot of time on land. So right. polar bears are super adapted to this seasonal sort of on the ice and in the water and on land. Right. We. Yeah. I think the closest we could get to was a penguin, but of course they're not a mammal. That, that's a bird. So polar bears really are quite special. Um, we we think of them kind of as a you know land using animal, but really they are totally tied to the sea and sea ice. So they really are part of the marine ecosystem, and yeah. it's a pretty cool pretty cool thing for a bear especially. Yeah. I should say. So we're going to have lots of time to talk about that. And talking about the conversations, they are already starting. So we have Tiger Broke, who uh, sent us a greeting from Jenkinson's Aquarium. Welcome, Jenkinson's Aquarium. It's great to have you here. We have EDLK, who said, hello from Eden Lake Elementary, grade two, Ms. Cater's class. Welcome, Ms. Cater's <laughs> class. It's great to have you here. And then we have P. Bear Den, who is sending out a welcome <laughs> from Alaska. Welcome, Alaska. It's great to have you here. Not a lot, uh, well, we're sharing some many characteristics in terms of the cold and snow with yourselves, as well as the other sites that have, uh, that have sent that off and to us now. Ladies and gentlemen, we would send that invitation to all of you, be you at an aquarium, be you at a zoo, your students, or even just individuals sitting at your computer who are watching this webcast. We want you to be an active part of this conversation conversation. So send in your questions by email to questions at pbears.org, to tweet them out to Tundra Connections or to use that chat window. We want to bring you in and have this as a conversation that takes place um, across, really across the world. So now, ladies and gentlemen, there have been some adaptations that have happened to the Arctic and to the changing ecosystem that have happened for our marine mammals. I'm going to pass it back over to Stefan again, mm -hmm. if you'd like to, to, to delve into that a little bit. Maybe some of the icy and the cold conditions and how that has affected the animals. Yeah, yeah. so as I mentioned, we have this really unique environment that freezes over. And there's really been kind of a couple of ways to deal with that. So for uh, things like bearded seals and ring seals, polar bears, they've adapted to live in that ice environment throughout the entire winter and they're year-round residents in the Arctic. And then there's another suite of, of ice whales 
and their adaptation is really to get out of Dodge. So when <laughs> things start to freeze, they get out and go to either the ice edge or where the ice is a lot more uh, active and there's cracks within those ice. So that could be uh, things like narwhal and beluga and bowhead whales are really highly adapted ice whales and they kind of share a bunch of characteristics in that um, they tend not to have a dorsal fin so they can it doesn't get damaged on the ice um, they're they're really adept at at finding cracks and holes and places in the ice and they must have a great sense of timing because they know when they need to be getting out of Hudson's Bay and it's not a short trip to get out of Hudson's Bay mm. several thousand kilometers um, if not more for many of the whales when they're migrating so absolutely incredible distances. we were talking about earlier on how the Hudson Bay itself is 1.5 million square kilometers which is about the size of Texas for our American friends or those of joining us in Canada that's about the same size as Alberta and Saskatchewan put together, so that that's quite a strip uh, to for, for them to for them to move around in, and then for them also to adjust in the midst of the claiming uh, the changing climate that's going on there. Jen, could you tell us about um, what's going to happen for these animals as the climate shifts? Yeah, well, maybe I'll just back up a little bit and talk about Hudson Bay because it's kind of a unique spot. We have a uh, sea ice that forms every year and then melts back so that's why the polar bears are here on land right now because mm -hmm. Hudson Bay is still covered with water and uh, as we start to go into the Arctic night we'll have that freeze over and the polar bears will be out there hunting seals and enjoying their time in the winter in the Arctic. Uh, we've seen some pretty dramatic changes though in this ice and as a consequence the polar bears are spending more time on land than they used to and uh, one of the ways I like to talk about this is when I was born in the late 1970s, that's when we had the first satellite images of where Arctic sea ice um, is in, over the entire Arctic. And uh, over the course of my lifetime, we've seen some pretty big changes. And in 2012, there was half of the sea ice that there was um, from when I was born. And BJ's bringing up a little bit. This is a just showing where the ice was in that particular um, year, 2012, uh, in September. And you can see it's Hudson Bay, totally ice-free, but then also the um, Northwest Passage, uh, lots of boats and things going through there, and polar bears waiting on land to get some more food. And, and not only boats. Uh, in recent years, we've had bowhead whales that have been tagged in the Eastern Arctic and in the Western Arctic meet in the middle of Northwest Passage. Uh, I'd be, the satellite tag showed them quite close together. So this raises some big questions about um, gene flow. So we have these groups that have been evolving for the last several hundred, if not thousand years separately, and now they're starting to come back together. And we don't really know what that's gonna mean if that's, mm -hmm. if they're, uh, they'll be fine or if mm -hmm. they'll they have some local adaptations to these environments you know a, a sense of direction that says go south when you're getting out and suddenly they get a go west signal or something <laughs> like that it's, it's going to be interesting to see all those changes that are happening as the ice regime changes and so when we talk about other animals that are starting to move around and find themselves as the climate continues to shift, what other marine mammals are we seeing, Stefan, that are, that, are, that are moving in? Yeah, well, we're getting it in a number. The ones that are um, quite interesting to me are killer whales. So mm -hmm. there's been a, a long uh, history of killer whales at least coming to uh, northern Baffin Island and, and coming in a little bit into the Arctic. But it's really been in the last 20 or 30 years that the ice conditions have changed and we see uh, killer whales coming all the way into Hudson's Bay. The last, I think, five years we've had reports of killer whales in Churchill, seen in Churchill. And that's, that's a new sort of uh, occurrence. And there, we think that things like uh, beluga and bowhead whales and narwhal are actually coming into the Arctic in order to get away from ma their major predators, which are killer whales. So for a long time, they've been able to escape killer whales 
um, by coming into the Arctic, and that's where they're giving birth and 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 really surviving. Killer whales don't like the ice as much as some of the ice-adapted whales. They have a big dorsal fin that can get damaged. Um, we do see in killer whales are incredibly adapted to a, a whole diversity of of uh, conditions. So we do have ice killer whales in Antarctica, which are really highly specialized, but they have to be super careful about how they're going about their business. Um, and Antarctica seems to be a lot more forgiving than the Arctic. A couple years ago we had a number of killer whales that got stuck in the ice in northern Quebec for a number of days, which was probably quite stressful for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm, I, I, Lisa, I, I, I'm curious, um, as these two ma marine mammals start to cross paths, have there been records of them actually crossing paths, of encounters between, between polar bears and, um, and, the, and the whales? No, oh, I'm actually not sure. Stefan, do you know? I don't know if that? there has been. There, yeah. We think that the ecosystem is going to change potentially as we yeah. lose ice, so it'll switch from one top predator to another. Yeah. Um, I know when there's, because ice whales will sometimes get stuck in ice, it's called a, an entrapment, um, and they'll get stuck in the ice, and polar bears will definitely take advantage of it and pull entire beluga whales up out of the ice. Like, polar bears are incredibly powerful, and yeah, to be able to pull out an entire beluga is, I, incredible, but yeah, no. I mean, no, but yeah. So, so as we see these marine mammals coming in, and as we see this ice shift that's taking place, how do we know it's how how do we know it's happening? And let's maybe go down the line. We'll just go Jen, and then over to you, Elisa, and then finally across to you, Stefan. Mm -hmm. How do we know that the uh, that the sea ice is changing, and well, what methods do we use to monitor it? Yeah, so if you want to go back before the satellite record, it's mostly coming from where ships have been, or you can use proxy records. Mm. But if you really want reliable data about where the sea ice is, uh, you have to go back to the beginning of the satellite record, which starts in 1979. Uh, the thing about the satellite record is it really just tells you um, the ice cover or the ice area. Uh, as a sea ice scientist, I'm often interested in how thick the sea ice is because thicker ice is more likely to stick around. And uh, we have some data from satellites that tell us about the age of the sea ice too. Um, so that's another thing that's really useful to hear about. Uh, as we know, Hudson Bay is mostly ice that's forming and going away each year, so the ice never gets older than about a year. But uh, up in the high Arctic, uh, we have a lot of ice that can survive for multiple years, and uh, that ice tends to be the thicker ice. And we've seen less and less of that, another indication that uh, the climate is warming and we're losing our sea ice. Mm. Thank you. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, um, I know I could ask questions all day long, but uh, students and, and, and officials from, from zoos and aquariums, I would invite you also to post those online. Again, just as a reminder, one more time, if you want to post it to Twitter, it's at hashtag Tundra Connections. Uh, it's by email to questions at pberries.org or using the chat window on the side. Um, Alisa, what about yourself? What are we finding? What, what tools do we use in terms of monitoring? Uh, so sure, I can talk a bit about how we know that some polar bears are changing or this population is changing what it's doing. We started research in this area in 1980 and we have this really fantastic data set. And when we started research back in the early 80s, uh, you know, these climate shifts, they weren't even on our radar. That wasn't a part of what we were doing. We just wanted to know anything about polar bears and this population. And then over time, we started seeing that things were changing. And because of this great sea ice data that we have, over long periods of time and the climate data that we have, we realized that when the sea ice patterns changed and when the sea ice was around um, for fewer weeks than normal, we saw changes in the polar bears uh, over time. So there's more problem bears if the sea ice breaks up early. Um, if As the sea ice declines uh, in it, the amount of time it's around, so it's freezing up later and breaking up earlier, so bears are spending more time on land, we are seeing a reduced population size. The bears in general are a little bit smaller. There are fewer cubs being produced in this population now. 
and you know we're seeing these effects that that we can tie to to climate and sea ice changes. It simply boils down to sea ice isn't around as much, so polar bears aren't getting to eat as much. It, it's that basic. Mm. If you do that to any animal population, you reduce the amount of time they can feed. You're going to see changes. Um, so with this uh, long-term mercury capture data, we can see that. We also put some satellite collars on polar bears, and we can track their movements on the sea ice and relate when and where they're moving uh, to what the sea ice is doing. And so we can see if they're changing where they move if the sea ice patterns change. And so we, we really are learning a, a lot about how polar bears are just so connected to sea ice and its conditions. And how long, we have a great question just about, about polar bears before I get to you, Stefan, to talk again about the monitoring systems. And this has been sent from P. Bear Den. Uh, <laughs> and P. Bear Den's question is, how long have we been studying polar bears? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, so the five polar bear countries got together. So there's Canada, the U.S., Alaska, Greenland, Norway, and Russia. Um, back in the mid-19th, uh, 20th century, so mid-1900s, uh, there was a lot of polar bear hunting going on. And we didn't really have any quotas and no real idea of the population as a whole. And people were just kind of going out there thinking that polar bears, you know, there were enough of them. Uh, and it was pretty easy to hunt them at the time. And in about the 60s, we realized that numbers seemed to be declining. And so the five polar bear nations got together in 1973, and they signed an international agreement that said, hey, we're going to research these bears and commit ourselves to the proper management of polar bears based on science. And so we really, actual research programs started kind of mid-70s. The program here started in 1980, uh, just outside of Churchill, Manitoba. And so by now we have over 30 years of data on polar bears, which for um, a lot of animal populations is pretty fantastic. We can get a lot, and, and we really need these long-term data series, especially when we're talking about climate changes, yeah. because climate is a very long-term mm. thing. And these changes happen over long periods of time, so we need these long data sets to say anything at all about what's going on. Yeah, climate is often defined as a 30-year average, yeah. <laughs> so we just got over that for sea ice and for polar bears, and so I think we can start to make more definitive statements at yeah, this point in hopefully. time. And just so you know, ladies and gentlemen, that bear that you see on that screen that was walking around the last part, that is a live feed, right? So we are, if you pop out these windows, you look behind us, all around us, this is the tundra. This is the Canadian Arctic. And that is a real polar bear walking out there. So it's exciting to be able to share with you all of what's going on in the midst of in the midst of these this beautiful environment and this and this and this powerful striking animal so um, Stefan we're gonna pass it over to you to, to, to close us off on just how long and how do we monitor and know what we actually know yeah um, I'll probably use kind of the example of some research that we're doing which is right at the beginning the the long-term data set on polar bears is incredible um, my research and one of the things that I'm really interested in is the food that the polar bears are eating and that's ring seals. So we expect as we go into the future, well let me step back, that right here in Churchill we have harbor seals, we have ring seals and we have bearded seals and the two that I'm most interested in are these two pretty closely related species, the harbor seals and the ring seals. Ring seals are super well adapted to life in the ice. They can maintain breathing holes um, throughout the winter. They den underneath or on top of the ice, but under snow drifts. And that's where polar bears uh, can access them in the spring and, and eat them. Um, and then harbor seals are very similar, except they don't maintain breathing holes. So they need open cracks in the ice to breathe. Um, and we expect as we go forward and as ice regime changes, we expect those harbor seal populations to increase and ring seal populations to decrease. And so we've started coming up every spring. This is an a interesting time of year for me. I don't get up here at this time very much. I'm usually up here in the spring. And we've just started with even the simplest of monitoring, which is counting how many seals, how many harbor seals, how many pups are we seeing, um, how many seals are we seeing on the ice? How does that compare to population estimates that we get from flying transects over the ice and counting seals? And really, we want to see how those two populations might be changing into the future. And then for polar bears, we know that they're really specialized for ring seals. Are they going to be able to take advantage of harbor seals 
we don't think so, but we don't really know. And it's gonna, so we're kind of at the beginning of this investigation of the next kind of level down underneath the top predator, which is polar bear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we talk about this, these changing climates that we're monitoring, but they're changing for a reason. So Jen, could you tell us maybe what are some of the reasons why these changes are taking place? Sure, and I'll talk about this. Um, there was just a intergovernmental panel on climate change report that was released. So scientists all over the planet got together and at the request of governments to summarize climate information for them because governments around the world are concerned about this. And so uh, what this report definitively said is that the warming we've observed over the last hundred years is a consequence of increased greenhouse gases. And that what will happen into the future is somewhat dependent on our choices. And so into the future, if we continue to increase greenhouse gases, uh, the planet is gonna warm a lot. And so we have this graphic that BJ just pulled up. This is the mean model projection, um, and that's if we take no action. And this, the second one, is if we take a lot of action. Actually, the future is really determined by how many greenhouse gases we emit. And uh, the future projections, they're all based on different scenarios going into the future. Uh, and the one that we're seeing here, that's the if we take action now, is pretty drastic action. That, that involves actually taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, something called negative emissions. So we're committed to some warming. Hopefully we can do something to make sure this doesn't get to be a pretty dire situation. Thank you so much. Now we talk about a claiming chi a climate that's there, but there's also some claim changing situations for the animals themselves. And so what are humans doing in order to, to adapt to those and, and even to help um, coexist with them in a positive way? Stefan, do you want to? Well, I think we have, as, as ecosystems change, mm -hmm. it's, it's the environment and people are part of those ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And so throughout the world, there's going to be some sort of adaptation that, that people will have to go through in order to survive in those environments. So it may be something like as uh, sea ice changes and we have more bears on shore for longer, um, we need to develop safer communities, safer for bears, safer mm -hmm. for people. And it's going to mean a different sort of action wherever you are within the world. And no one kind of thing is going to be appropriate, I don't think, for on the ground, mm -hmm. except for everyone reducing carbon emissions wherever they can, in whatever ways they can. Excellent, thank you. So, um, as we look at learning about how to monitor these systems, as we look at the different impacts that humans have on them, um, what are some roles that humans can play to actually help our marine animals? Lisa? Uh, well, I think, for example, at Polar Bears International, we really want to educate people um, and also try to connect them with the environment in any way we can. And that's part of the reason that we do these webcasts at this time of the year. That's part of the reason we partnered with Explore.org and Frontiers North Adventures to bring you these live cams that we stream all throughout bear season. Um, you know, we can never know for sure, but... We, we really hope that by showing people, you know, just the daily lives of these animals, uh, what their environment is like, trying, that, trying to connect them to you in your homes, um, that's really one way to get people inspired to take action. Uh, you know, if, if you're never seeing something uh, for yourself, it, it's really hard to, to make that connection. And for a lot of people, it's really hard to get here. Um, Churchill's not that far away, but you know, it's not cheap to fly here. It's really not easy to get up to the high Arctic and see, you know, things like narwhals or bowhead whales and things like that. Uh, so any little bit that we can do to bring this to you and to talk about it and to answer your questions and really get people feeling, you know, part of it and like they can be part of the solution, that, that's really our, our hope, you know, inspiring change through education. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's also a really big role for zoos and aquariums that's where you have huge. people coming in and, and making that connection between people and the animals is so important but then partnering that with education about those ecosystems and giving visitors tools to to really make a difference is part of the whole kind of package on how we communicate and how we connect people 
to all these great places that we really need to be taking care of. And talking about zoos, I just want to say a shout out to, to and I'm, I may not do a very good job on your name, but Kalarabi, who is joining us from the Milwaukee County Zoo. Milwaukee <laughs> County Zoo, oh, it's yeah. great to have you guys here. Now, not everybody could get up here. And so not everybody would have a chance to see where these bears have their dens and things along those lines. But Ms. Hack's class, which is a grade six class from Brampton, uh, said that her students want to know if any polar bears have given birth in cubs, uh, given birth to cubs that are under your care. So um, I'm going to throw that back to you in terms <laughs> of the zoos, Stefan. Yeah, well, we do have um, successful breeding in zoos. In uh, Winnipeg at the Assiniboine Park Zoo, right now all our bears are too young, so they're not close to breeding age yet. But there has been success in, in many other institutions um, throughout North America, which is we learn so much from when those kind of awesome events occur. And it's, it's super hard to research bears in dens in the wild. It's really important to know because we can learn a lot about how we're doing things within facilities. Um, but also, it really is such a critical time for polar bears that we really need to know as much as we can about that, that, that time. Where what makes the best den, what kind of habitat, uh, what are the conditions, how noisy it can be, um, all these things that all will feed in and help us design better uses on the landscape. So we can say, you know, don't drive your skidoos within two kilometers or all these different actions. They're all really based on knowing how, what bears need to den, what, what makes them happy. Mm. And talking about uh, bears being happy and being in good conditions, but we're also seeing potentially some bears that aren't in good conditions, right? As these bears here wait in order to get back onto the sea ice. Uh, so Elisa, this is Tiger Broke. Thanks, Tiger Broke, for this question. But um, Tiger Broke asked, what percentage of bears are you seeing in less than desirable conditions? Yeah, it's pretty hard to talk about um, percentage of bears this year. We, we're getting a lot of flux through this area, so Part of the reason that the polar bears are here right now is that they're migrating through. The sea ice will form um, first in Hudson Bay right in this area and these bears know that. And so a lot of bears are pushing through the area. We do have a few that are hanging around. You know, we have seen some really healthy looking bears this year. We've seen, uh, in fact, one pretty fat one. <laughs> it's pretty funny out there. Um, but, you know, we have seen a good handful of pretty thin bears. In fact, we saw a bear yesterday um, he got a little maybe perturbed by some noises on the landscape and he, he got up and he just walked a little ways away and dug himself a little snow bed and just kind of plopped down again and you know he looked pretty tired and he mm. looked like he was really trying to conserve his energy so right now as things are you know I don't think there's a bear near here at the moment that we're afraid you know is gonna starve to death in the next week or two if, if the sea ice comes in on time uh, there are some that you know, they will really be trying to conserve their energy for the next few weeks and hope to, I'm sure, get a seal as soon as they can. Um, every year's a little bit different. This past year was actually a pretty good sea ice year, uh, 2013. The year before that was a very, very poor sea ice year. Um, but based on last year, I think most of the bears are kind of hanging in there. Um, just a, a few that aren't looking so good. This is also just a small snapshot of all the bears that are around Hudson Bay right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's really, you know, it's tough. And we just really hope that the, the sea ice is going to show up pretty soon. So, uh, Jen, we had a, an, another question that came to us that was just about when should this bay ice or even Arctic ice be forming and as opposed to when actually is it forming? So I've heard that it's about a month longer that they're on land yeah in total in total yeah. so this that gives you some sense of it um, I think when you talk about sea ice conditions I often get this question you know when should things be happening when will the Arctic go ice free and you hear these things in the news like somebody said it was gonna happen in 2012 or something and you're like oh wait that was two years ago and the thing to know about sea ice is that there's a lot of variability in it so year to year you can't really interpret that as a climate signal you really have to look at a long-term record something like the 30 years we were talking about as a climate signal and it's only with that kind of perspective that you understand you know hey things are changing around here um, 
that helps some. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really hard. I, I mean, it leads it leads me to that question just about when that bay is not when that ice is not formed, these bears are not eating. So, uh, Alisa, what like how long is that window that these bears are eating for? Sure. Well, these bears came off the sea ice in about July this year, and so they've been on land for you know three to, three to four months at, at this point. And when they are on land, they they are looking for food. I mean, they're bears, so we see a lot of bears around here that are eating kelp, so that kind of seaweed. Uh, they will also eat berries in the summer. They might uh, get lucky and find a caribou once in a while. Um, a super lucky bear might be able to pull a, a beluga calf out of the Churchill River or something like that. But a lot of these bears really aren't adding many calories, and they're not adding the calories from fat, which actually gives them body mass. Mm -hmm. um, so they go, they're going for quite a while without food. And females that are pregnant right now, so they'll be in their dens right now, so they also came off the ice in July, and they're not going to get back on the sea ice until February or March. So they can go up to eight months without eating, and while they're not eating, they're raising cubs that are pretty demanding for mom's attention. Mm. So, you know, the bears can go quite a while, but that's why they need that body fat. Uh, they, they are losing weight when they're on land. Right now, most of them are trying to conserve energy. Now that it's getting colder, you can kind of see... You know, the mood pick up a bit among some of them. We're seeing more playing now, more sparring than we did a couple weeks ago. We're seeing more movement on the landscape, so um, it's, it's easier. They're not going to overheat now. It's, you know, they're probably looking forward to the ice coming in, but um, they can go a long time without eating. They probably don't love going a long time without eating, and they're really looking mm -hmm. forward to that next seal. For sure. So Ms. Hawk's class here. Thanks so much, Ms. Hawk. And to all of our people who are sending those questions in, we very much want you to be a part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. But Ms. Hawk's class just asked, what inspired the scientists personally to join Tundra Connections and help protect the polar bears? You know, as we think of, because it's not just, just classes that are here, but for some of those students who are looking at the rest of their life, um, what inspired you, Stefan, to, to go down your route as a scientist, which eventually is what led you here today? Yeah. Well, I think right from the beginning, I loved animals and, you know, got into trouble having frogs in the house and all the <laughs> normal stuff that you do. Um, and then I've been slowly kind of working my way north and up the food chain in terms of research. So I studied, kind of started out with shrews and then into flying squirrels and then into polar bears and ring seals and bowhead whales and narwhals. So I've kind of been working up and, and really trying to work into the Arctic, which is just this amazing ecosystem that um, it, in some respects it's such a simple system but then as soon as you start trying to figure out how it's changing and what's happening it's incredibly complex so yeah so I've just been enthralled and, and fell in love with the Arctic and all the species that that really make up the Arctic and and because I have that kind of love of, of this ecosystem I don't really want to see it change we know that it might switch from a top predator of a polar bear to top predator of a killer whale. I kind of like polar bears. I'd rather have them maintained as the top predator. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so over, I'll tell you, the little bit of time that we have got to spend here over the last few days to see the polar bears sparring, to see the, pol the polar bears playing, to see the beautiful interaction amongst these animals has just been so very, very inspiring. And really, as we look to explore.org and to uh, Polar Bears International, as they share these, these little windows into these fabulous and, and, and powerful animals' lives. They allow us to bring them into our own lives, bring them into our classrooms, bring them into our zoos, and, uh, and, and see that it's something that is not just so very far away, but can be close. Ladies and gentlemen, we are into our last 10 minutes of this conference, and I want to do one more call out. If you have a question, if you have a comment, if you have something inspiring you want to share, in terms of um, in terms of marine mammals, in terms of polar bears, we'd like to invite you to tweet it out to uh, hashtag Tundra Connections. You want to heat uh, to tweet it out to polar to questions at pbears.org. Um, we want you to be a part of this, and we'd love to end with a with, with a with continuing that conversation that we have going. And you know what? We have talked about these changing these claim, these changing climates and some of the concerns that's there. Um, is, is there anything that, that, that can be done for this? I'll pass it over to our climate scientist, Jen. 
Yeah, and I will say, as a climate scientist, I often get this question, and you know, I am someone who is really interested in doing something about this, and so I am, but my specialty is more in understanding the climate system, and I do make somewhat of a distinction in a mm -hmm. lot of ways between those two things. That's, I think it's really important for climate science, so I'm going to say, there are many things that you can do to help this, but this is a big problem. That's something we know mm. from the climate science. We know, I mean, some of the changes that are in store really require us taking a lot of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere mm -hmm. and changing the way that we get energy. Um, and that's those are challenging things. Um, but everything starts at a local level, and so, you know, it's individuals who make those differences. So. You know, you start to do something and you inspire someone else to do it. That's um, the question you had about why are you up here, you know. That's part of why I'm up here. I think it's really important to tell the story, to tell people what's going on, and to really give the facts, give the data, and then say, look, and this is something we control into the future. All we have to do is reduce the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're seeing some great questions that are coming in here, so I want to make sure that we get to these before we sign off for today. From our friends, uh, Kalarabe, have there been more bears coming into the town of Churchill? And if so, what is being done to mitigate the issue? Elisa, I'll pass that over to you. Sure. So over time, uh, we we are seeing more bears uh, come, you know, trying to come into the town of Churchill. Churchill has a really fantastic program, the Polar Bear Alert Program, um, that's helped managed by Manitoba Conservation. And so they, you know, they have a great facility there. Um, there, we have a phone line in Churchill uh, that you can phone whenever you see a bear, and you alert people uh, around town. And they'll go first. They just try to push the bear out, just try to you know make loud noises, get the bears away from town. If a bear is being a, a really problem bear, they will put the bear in a holding facility uh, for a certain amount of time, depending on if the bear's been around before, how old the bear is, and then eventually they will fly the bear out of town uh, where they hope it won't come back. And especially at this time of year, we're flying a lot of bears farther up north where the sea ice is gonna form in hopes that the bears don't come into town anymore. Mm. If, if a bear mm. comes into town, it's bad for people, but it's also bad for the bear. Uh, we, you know, we really don't want bears getting shot if they're trying to break into a home to find food, and we don't want that for us either. Um, we have other towns up the coast of Hudson Bay that, um, you know, don't have as many resources right now as, as Churchill is lucky enough to have. So those towns are seeing more and more problem bears coming in looking for garbage or food, and so we are really, we want to get working on that to try to help those people because, you know, it's really... Polar bears are so neat and interesting, but when you're when you're living in a town where it's a reality that if you walk out your door there might be a polar bear on the street, it, it's an interesting thing. And we really we want kids to be able to play in their yards, and we want polar bears be, to be able to be polar bears and do their thing. So we are we have a lot of great people working on this human bear conflict issue, um, and hopefully we can mitigate that. And if the sea ice returns to normal, I think that will help. If the sea ice conditions continue to deteriorate, it might become more of a problem. Uh, so we'll have to watch that. So we have time for one last question. I'm going to throw this one out to our friend Tiger Broke, who has uh, been active in this conversation throughout. And I'm going to throw this over to you, Stefan. And Tiger Broke asks, are you seeing the effects of climate change in the Hudson Bay area in other species as well? Well, my research is right at the beginning, so I'll keep you posted on <laughs> harbor seals and ring seals, which are closest to my heart. But one of the things that I mentioned a little bit was the killer whales. And we know that over the last few years, we're getting pretty much killer whale reports every year. Um, from the data that we have from people reporting killer whales, um, there's been some really great research showing that over the last uh, 30 years, as the Hudson Strait has become more open in the summer, um, the number of reports of killer whale sightings has increased over time. So we think this is an indication of a switch, maybe, to killer whales taking advantage of that open ice and potentially the start of a switch from a polar bear dominated top predator with humans to a killer whale predator as the top, uh, at the top of the food chain with humans, so yeah.
interesting stuff. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our time has indeed come to a close. So I want to thank all my panelists for sharing their, their passion, their energy, their research, and all the great work that they're doing. And Polar Bears International's goal is to keep polar bears in the Arctic always. It's important to remember that time remains for saving polar bears and their ice habitat, and we can all do our part to help make this happen. First off, thank you for what you are already doing. By like lowering your thermostat, riding your bike, reducing the electronic device time, and increasing your outdoor time. Vote with your family's money dollars to support companies that you know have sustainable business plans. Then vote at the ballot box for policy leaders whose climate change action and 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 who are calling for that and. Um, as well as doing local things in terms of farms and things along those lines where you can go and get those local goods. Everyday actions are going to help save the polar bears. But we're sure you're wondering what else can you do? So we're going to get a screen here that's going to show here in terms of uh, these actions that, that can be taken on the local level in terms of, uh, in terms of the taking a global's um, opportunity to create an online resource for individuals and teachers um, from online mobile app called Commit to Act available on Android and iPhone which will allow you to track your actions while, cha while sharing them with your friends and family. Um, we know that uh, the Polar Bears International has a uh, petition that you can sign which will help, which will ask world leaders to take action on climate change and then take the next steps by pledging to additional energy savings. Register on Polar Bears, um, on Project Polar Bear and develop a community project that reduces carbon dioxide load in the atmosphere. Also check out the links to the teacher resources that are available under the Tundra Connections page for more information and material to do in your class. Ladies and gentlemen, every action makes a consequence. Everything that you are doing is helping. And so if every house in the US alone were to switch to one light bulb, only one light bulb, to an energy star light bulb, we would save enough energy to light three million homes for a year. Isn't that incredible? That's the power of your individual actions. And ladies and gentlemen, it's those actions, whether you're a student, whether you're an individual at home, whether you're joining us from a zoo, wherever you happen to be joining us today, remember that these actions have a huge impact. And when they're scaled up, they're going to help make sure that polar bears are always in the Arctic. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you.